Eee, what's next? Am I next? Yes, yeah, changing got, pace a little bit with Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Yeah, the first of his sort of big budget American efforts then. At the age of 30, I already felt painfully out of sync with the protagonists of Scott Pilgrim versus the world when I watched it in the cinema, even if the video game aesthetic flourishes seemed oddly targeted at an older audience. I was worried that returning to it some 10 years later would achieve nothing so much as to reaffirm my burgeoning sense of social irrelevance <laughs> and the realisation that I am now pretty much halfway through my life expectancy. Turns out I needn't have worried. Scott Pilgrim vs. The World remains an exceptionally shallow, uh, or sorry, remains as exceptionally shallow now as it was then. Only the intervening decade has thrown into relief the suspicion I had at the time that it is in fact really, really entertaining. If you've yet to see Scott Pilgrim, and based on the box office, that's a distinct likelihood, you should know that it is based on a graphic novel by Canadian author Brian Lee O'Malley and centres on the titular protagonist as he struggles through the pratfalls of dating a high schooler five years his younger while being infatuated with an enigmatic loner named Ramona Flowers. Informed by the cultures of video games, graphic novels and anime, Pilgrim's journey to presumed emotional fulfilment is beset by the need to best each of Ramona's seven evil exes in hyper-stylized combat. Cue the onomatopoeic captions. What I said at the time, and I know this because I went back earlier today actually and listened to our podcast from 2010, <laughs> um, still holds true. I think Seven Evil Exes is at least a couple too many. <laughs> the overall <laughs> pacing of the movie feels like it could do with smartening up a little. My fear that I would feel increasingly distanced from the material in my advancing years was, however, unfounded. It turns out that Scott's interaction with his world and the characters in it remains fresh and amusing as it was at the time of release. In particular, Michael Serra's performance as Michael Serra is peak Michael Serra. <laughs> and certainly among the finest interpretations of the character Michael Serra we have seen, <laughs> Michael Serra or otherwise. People's what criticism Michael Serra? <laughs> I don't know, but people's criticism of Serra and actors of that ilk in general baffles me somewhat. If anything, you've less to worry about because you know exactly what to expect going in. And if you don't like Michael Serra, the news is you're not going to like this movie. <laughs> don't, don't rent it. There, I saved you a fiver. If you're a director and the character you're hoping to portray is essentially Michael Serra, then guess what the best tool is for that job? <laughs> That's right, Michael Serra. <laughs> it's like criticising a world-class sniper for having... <laughs> It's like criticising a world-class sniper for being predictable in their choice of the same high-powered rifle each time they get deployed. <laughs> Have you tried this spud gun with the extended barrel and custom <laughs> spring mechanism? No thanks, I think I'll take my usual gun. Did I mention I call it Michael Serra? <laughs> In retrospect, Scott Pilgrim has a most excellent cast of young supporting actors, a number of them right at the tipping point of their careers. I've developed a real soft spot for Mary Elizabeth Winstead in the intervening years. I've even re-watched that terrible thing remake. And I keep waiting for her to be allowed the opportunity she clearly deserves, rather than the status she's attained as some sort of Swiss army knife among actors. Here she straddles the gulf between enigmatic, desirable and vulnerable admirably. Though, in terms of pound-for-pound -pound impact, the show should surely must belong to Kieran Culkin as Wallace, mm. Scott's wonderfully incorrigible gay roommate. It helps that the cast is working from a script that has its fair share of zingers and amusing non-secretors. And while I'm not going to advocate for it attaining some sort of preservation status, I would like to direct your attention to the fact that it contains the line, you were once a vegan and now you will be gone, <laughs> which is in itself infinitely better than most things. <laughs> <laughs> How much of that kind of dialogue is carried wholesale from the source material, I do not know, but if not O'Malley himself, then surely a medal is deserved of right and his co-writer Michael Bacall. Not that this is a film I'd want to revisit too frequently, mind you. I don't think sustained repeat viewing would do the stage curtains any favours. If a movie can succeed almost entirely on surface appeal, however, then this is surely it. I suspect your mileage may vary somewhat based on your exposure to or preference for gaming culture of a fairly narrow generational window, but it turns out we three are exactly the same age as O'Malley, and I suspect this might play heavily into it. I shall be intrigued to revisit this in 2030. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had, um, no, I've, I, I've no idea what I had. Apparently I didn't have it that strongly. A brain fart? <laughs> uh, yeah, I had the the feeling, and if you've just listened to the podcast, you can tell me if I'm correct, Craig. The feeling I had, at the, that what I said at the time, because I remember not particularly liking this when I saw it in the cinema. You, had, you hadn't seen it at the time we recorded the podcast. I don't know, okay. No, um, no. Well, I, I kind of had the feeling that I didn't, like it that much, um, which I thought was a bit strange because 
we were so absolutely the target audience for this. Mm. This was our generation of gaming, you know, and it was, um, and I didn't particularly care for it. Whereas I've seen it a couple of times just in the last couple of years again, and I find that while it's not as good a film as Hot Fuzz, it's honestly challenging Hot Fuzz simply for pure entertainment value for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. To the point where it's like, it's not, there's really not that much between them. It's not a deep film, but none of Edgar Wright's films are deep. But they're not quite confections, but they're not like weighty things or anything. But So there's a lot of surface appeal in this, and, and that's fine. I don't necessarily expect a lot more from him. But I, just, I found this thoroughly entertaining, and mm. I like Michael Cera. That helps, because as you say, he's, he's Michael Cera. I think the only time he's not been Michael Cera is in This Is The End, when he turns up to play... Michael Sarah, the dick Michael Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Also, maybe the last time I saw Michael Sarah, come to think of it. But <laughs> yeah, I, d- I don't think you might be wrong there, yeah. Yeah, it's. I mean, I think it's it did suffer in terms of its box office because it does have quite a narrow appeal. I mean, yeah, I know gaming is such big business now, it's so common. But for a lot of the games that this references, it's when it was a much more niche activity. So I think it perhaps suffers for that a bit. but uh, This is what I think the problem is with it, Drew. And I do wonder that my experience of it initially, because I did quite enjoy it initially by by all accounts based on what, I, <laughs> what we spoke about in the podcast, but I wonder if your experience is the same, that, yeah, the, that sort of overlay of the, the video game aesthetic is relevant to people our age, but it was... And it was marketed largely on that as well, I think. Mm -hmm. However, and I wonder if that's informed our expectations going in, because actually it's a film about the social mores of a generation sort of 10 years younger than us and Mm -hmm. their interactions largely. And I wonder if that initially that's been the disappointment, if anything, has been that, oh, right, okay, maybe I don't relate so much as to the people in this. Bizarrely, you've got 20-somethings interacting with a world that is informed by the visual aesthetic of 30-somethings, if that makes sense. And my experience of going back and watching this again recently was that actually having put some distance between that has almost narrowed the gap on somewhat, and I kind of even enjoyed it more this time, if that... Does that make sense? I guess so. And I know what you're saying about the culture thing too, because I remember... Um, Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist which Michael Cera also starred in which was just a couple of years before this I think um, and I was very aware watching that, that it's like yeah this is a generation after me and it felt quite different whereas yeah, like the stylings are for a generation but the content isn't so I don't know why that doesn't bother me now but it's just a, I say a really entertaining film um, and just to go back to the visual stylings too, this may be um, peak comedy editing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the match cuts and the scene transitions this are amazing. <laughs> Unbelievable. Like, yeah. They, they, so they tell a story and they're funny. I don't even think I appreciated them enough at the time, Drew. No, I think I, I only really appreciated it this time round. I definitely didn't, but yeah, watching them this time, it's like, yeah, they are really good. Hmm. Only other thing I'll say before I finally let Scott talk is uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll let him do it every now and then. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm kind of on board with your opinions of Mary Elizabeth Winstead too I, mm. like, I want her to have more to do I like her, I, fi- I do find her likeable from the first time I remember seeing her in Die Hard 4 mm. and I very recently watched her in Gemini Man and she does as much as she can with what she's given but she's not yeah. given enough and it's quite frustrating because I don't feel she ever is I don't yeah. feel she's ever been stretched as an actor although she's done some sort of um, smaller independent stuff that I need to catch up with Drew um, but there's always this really frustrating thing of why isn't why isn't she bigger why isn't she the Scarlett Johansson of that generation kind of thing yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's frustrating I, I do feel she has the ability and this may be the, the best time she's ever usually had to to show what she's got. Just not yeah. enough people got to see it. The Thing remake is definitely not it, because... <laughs> <laughs> definitely. She's probably still the best thing in it. But it's, a, it's a prequel. It's totally not. It's a second remake. Except, but only the first <laughs> remake is the one that was anybody should bother with. Yes. Um, and now, Scott. <laughs> yeah. Um, as best as I can remember, I liked this back in the time. You did. Back in the day. You did. Um, I know it's probably open to accusations of style over substance, but... When there's this much style, it's hard to care too much. Um, I 
think I've completely forgotten about it in the, the 10 years. I don't think it's ever crossed my mind once in the intervening time since recording that podcast. So it was quite a quite a pleasant surprise to come back to it this time round and liked it quite a lot as well. It does feel less essential than other Wright's other films, I think. It, it feels a bit more flyaway. But it's hard to care too much about that when it is this funny because it is mm. as you mentioned just really really entertaining it's a visual treat and it's very funny all the way throughout and I think all of the cast is great I don't think there's a single duff note in there um, everyone plays parts really really well uh, it's a very strong supporting cast and yeah, I think Michael Cena plays a blinder in it so yeah there's an awful lot to like in here and almost nothing to dislike unless you just can't get your head around the aesthetic, which I presume is something that yeah. quite a lot of people won't be able to do. It is a bit strong. Yeah, I suspect it'll be a turn-off for as many people as it will be a, a, a positive. Yeah, um, but I think if, obviously we're all on board with that, and I think if you can get over that hurdle, then there's an awful lot of joy to be had in this, and it certainly deserves to be it deserves to be a hit, not a flop. Um, and I, I, I can't quite understand how it flopped so badly um, when it is this funny but uh, well that's that's the business for you well, what's the status of this now has it has it achieved cult status yet because it feels like it should have done and I, I noted in that review way back 10 years ago that I felt like it was probably the kind of film that was destined to become that if, if you can have a, you know a cult film adorned with this kind of budget but I don't know I don't know what people's opinion of this is now I've got no frame of reference for that I know people again we're just uh, the same sort of group of other podcasters that I mentioned earlier I know they really like this um, I think people like Edgar Wright like this but outside of people that like Edgar Wright I don't think it's that well known mm. which is which is a real shame yeah the only thing this is really missing to, honestly that would elevate it to the status of something like a hot fuzz is that I don't think it's I, I think it lacks the emotional engagement I think it I don't and I don't know if that's just a generational thing but I didn't feel that invested emotionally in any of the characters you know for example in hot fuzz uh, not in hot fuzz sorry um, in Shaun of the Dead in particular there's this there's this element that crops up now and again where you realise that you actually really have connected with these characters where amongst all the mayhem and all the stupid stuff that's going on there's that bit towards the end where Simon Pegg says, I don't think I could kill my mum and my best friend in the same day. Yeah. And it kind of punches you in the chest a little bit emotionally. You weren't expecting it. And I don't think this or the other sort of big Hollywood um, production that we'll talk about um, soon uh, have have that layer to them. Yeah, but it almost does succeed just purely on an aesthetic level, but I can see why, like Scott said, that would be, you know, as, as much of a turn off as it would be a positive for some people. Yeah, the the Cornetto Challenge in particular really have heart. Yeah. And um, when we covered the final film with Tom tonight uh, a couple of years ago, while I enjoyed it a lot, one of my criticisms was that it lacked heart. Mm. This is a bit the same. I think it's not as quite as much to this film's detriment as it is to Baby Driver, so because it's mm-hmm. not really about that. It doesn't. Yeah. Um, it's it's all fairly shallow, but all these people are fairly shallow. They're like you know, so between seventeen and twenty three. They're they, none of this this relationship are led to mean all that much. You know, it's all and the way they talk and the things. It's all fairly surface level anyway. Yeah. Um, so it's not so much to its detriment, but it's still weird why this didn't do more. <laughs> Mm. And one thing also, I somehow managed to forget Mary Elizabeth Winstead in Ten Cloverfield Lane, in which she's excellent. So she is. I apologise for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quite a significant yeah. role in a fairly popular film. Yes, the sort of thing that I feel like it should there should be a lot more of. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 